Well, thank you, Cathy, for that kind and thoughtful and indeed generous introduction. In fact, I have a small list of uh, thank yous. And firstly, um, thanks to the British School for offering me this year's visiting fellowship and the chance to um, work on my current research project. Secondly, I would like to thank the staff and um, the students of the school for making me feel so welcome when I finally got here in March. Thirdly, I would like to thank the librarian and her colleagues for running so impeccably this marvellous library and for specific help with this lecture. And I would also like to thank all the uh, residents and readers who helped to um, transform uh, the library into a lecture theatre this afternoon. And, you know, I felt, you know, I came in at the end, uh, which uh, uh, they didn't mind too much. Lastly, uh, but hardly least, I would like to thank this audience tonight um, for coming. <coughs> and I'd like to dedicate this lecture to the memory of the late Dr. Hector Catling and to the late Professor Christopher Mee. Both were devoted servants of the British School and both are sorely missed. This evening, I want to focus on one particular problem in the history of Alexander the Great, namely his responses to Persian culture. In the English language scholarship, these responses are labelled Alexander's Persianising. In modern Greek, these responses are covered by the term persopoesis, as I learned from an excellent lecture in this recent series on Alexander at the Ethnicon Idrima Erevnon. <clears throat> in the limited time available to me, I shall concentrate on one aspect only of Alexander's Persianising, a neglected one, as I believe, namely Alexander's use in Asia of chariots. <clears throat> I now frame the problem as I see it briefly. A number of recent studies have shown that the response of the classical Greek world to the Persian Empire on its eastern doorstep was more complex than previously thought. Older scholarship, such as Edith Hall's influential book, Inventing the Barbarian, stressed ancient Greek ethnocentricity and a deep divide between West and East. More recent work emphasises interaction between the Aegean Greek world and the cultures of the Near East. For instance, the splendid new book by Kostas Vlasopoulos entitled Greeks and Barbarians. <clears throat> so, back to Alexander. The 19th century German historian Johannes Droysen famously reconstructed the Macedonian king as a pioneer of cultural fusion the fusion of Macedonians, Greeks, and Persians. This 19th century reconstruction took a severe mourning in the 20th century, especially in the work of the late Ernst Badian and of Alan Bosworth. There is as yet no consensus, as is clear from recent disputation in print between the Alexander scholars Pierre Brion, who was here in Athens recently, and Robin Lane Fox. <clears throat> These opposing modern interpretations of Alexander reflect the conflicting nature of the ancient classical sources for Alexander. As far as the treatment in these sources of Alexander's Persianizing is concerned, my own view is this. Fragments, or rather citations, of otherwise lost Alexander histories in uh, later Greek um, literature preserve detailed descriptions of Alexander's Persianizing behaviour, his Persianized court in particular. These descriptions go back to Greek speaking eyewitnesses. In Alexander's own time, they must have commanded considerable Greek interest. However, these descriptions are not found in the surviving Alexander histories, none of them earlier than the age of Julius Caesar. The reasons for this omission are a matter for debate, although not for now. 
Well, that's the end of my introduction. The rest of the lecture is in five segments. So, first segment. To my knowledge, Alexander makes his first public appearance on a chariot in Babylon, at any rate in our ancient sources, in the year 331 BC. By way of background, as far as we know, earlier Macedonian kings of Alexander's dynasty did not normally ride on chariots. Unlike in uh, Tutankhamun's tomb, for instance, no chariot was found in tomb two at Vergina. Famously, Alexander himself rode to war on his trusty steed, Bucephalus. In classical antiquity, what the Greeks called a harmer, the two-wheeled war chariot, was essentially a phenomenon of Asia. I mean, it was a phenomenon of Homer, uh, but in real time, it was essentially a phenomenon of Asia. Here were the plains and plateau that this fighting style required. In the ancient Near East, Alexander was also in a region where the chariot was a traditional symbol of kingship. The classical writers Herodotus, Xenophon and Quintus Curtius all describe stately processions in which Achaemenid Persian kings rode out on a chariot. Famously, the last Persian king of the Achaemenid dynasty, Darius III, went to war on a chariot. I mean, in slang, in English slang, we would say bad call, Darius, um, because uh, in two battles, Issus in what is now southeast Turkey and Galgamela in what is now northern Iraq, in both these battles, Alexander, on his horse, defeated Darius on his chariot. As a result, the war chariot now acquired a negative symbolism at least in the West. In this light, Alexander's behaviour after the Battle of Galgamela is all the more surprising. A mere three weeks later, he chose to enter the city of Babylon on a chariot. And here is how the 17th century French painter Charles Le Brun imagined the scene. Well, we have here the first recorded use of a chariot by Alexander, or indeed by any Macedonian king, to my knowledge. Writing in Latin, the Alexander historian Quintus Curtius presents Alexander's entry into Babylon as the centrepiece of, of a carefully planned pageant of welcome. In this pageant, according to Curtius, Alexander stands on a chariot. Kuros. Well, Curtius is not the most reliable historian. Has he introduced Roman colouring, as he does elsewhere in his Alexander history? <clears throat> is he thinking of the triumph? The answer of modern scholarship is a no. Curtius includes another telltale detail. The pageant, Curtius states, included a Babylonian procession bearing gifts for Alexander, gifts of horses, cattle, and wild animals. As scholars have seen, this looks like Persian ceremonial. In particular, it recalls the Persepolis reliefs. The entry of the ruler into one of his cities on his royal chariot, this too was an Achaemenid Persian usage, as we know from the classical writers. It's like being back in the university lecture theatre. <laughs> in sum, on this point, after his second victory over Darius at Galgamela, Alexander decided to enter Babylon in the style of a Persian king. Well, why? As I believe, he did so because in Babylon, for the first time, Alexander had captured a really important centre of Persian power with a royal palace used by the Persian kings themselves. In entering in this way before that particular audience, Alexander now posed as the legitimate heir of Darius III. 
The classical writers missed this symbolism of Alexander's style of entry into Babylon. To my knowledge, so do most modern Alexander narratives. Well, that's the uh, end of my first segment. On to the second. A year later, in 330 BC, Alexander finally caught up with the fugitive Darius in what is now northern Iran, only to find that Darius had been murdered by his senior entourage. As with the Babylon pageant, Alexander's reaction to the murder of Darius was to put on a public show, to engage in what it's now fashionable to term theatricality, of which more in a moment. Alexander now went much further in showing his openness to Persian customs. In effect, he now remodelled his court along Persian lines. In parenthesis, I should make clear that by Alexander's court, I mean, and I'm here self-plagiarising from my book, the spatial and social framework of Alexander's existence as a ruler. And we do need to remember that most of Alexander's contemporaries who saw Alexander in person did so in the context, not of the battlefield, but of the king's travelling court. Well, Alexander's transformation of his court affected Alexander personally. For instance, in 330 BC, he is said to have acquired a harem. This detail preserved only in the historian Diodorus of Sicily, Sicily, has been doubted. On the other hand, it accords with the known importance of the Persian king's female entourage, which travelled with the king on his journeys and his campaigns. It also accords with the polygamous tendencies of Alexander's own dynasty. I am inclined to accept it. A much more widely reported detail is Alexander's transformation of his personal appearance. Alexander now adopted a version of Persian regal dress. Its most recognisable element was a Persian-style purple overgarment incorporating a vertical white stripe down the front. Greeks called this a mesoleukos kitone, or kitone with a white middle, and Darius is wearing one here in the Alexander Mosaic. As I believe, this transformation of Alexander's travelling court prepares us for his next known appearance on a chariot, in the sources, that is. This happens a year later, in mid-329 BC, when we find Alexander in ancient Bactria. He was now in pursuit of a new Persian king called Bessus. It was Bessus who had murdered Darius, his king and kinsman, the previous year. Shortly after Alexander had transformed his court in 330 BC, the usurper Bessus had declared himself to be the new great king and, in effect, set himself up as Alexander's rival. Well... Alexander's officers finally captured Bessus, not far from modern Ai Karnum, but on the north side of the river Oxus, in what is now Tajikistan. The Alexander historian Arian, who was a contemporary and indeed protégé of the Roman Emperor Hadrian, describes what happened next. Alexander, who had yet to meet the captive, gave advance orders for Bessus to be stripped and bound. Wearing a yoke, the humiliated Bessus was to be placed alongside the main road to await the passage of Alexander and his army. As you can see on the screen, Alexander arrives at this carefully prepared scene on what Arian's Greek text calls a harmer, that is, once more, a two-wheeled chariot. Well, why did Alexander choose to dismount Bucephalus and get on a chariot at this moment? Arian makes no comment, nor have modern commentaries on Arian, to my knowledge. Yet this parade before Bessus 
was clearly another piece of regal theatre. As at Babylon, Alexander's appearance on a chariot must have had, I believe, a particular intended meaning. This is a 19th century depiction of the scene by a French artist who enjoyed considerable success in the United States. Well, we know that Alexander's gruesome punishment of Bessus was not a Macedonian style of punishment. It was, in fact, a Persian style of punishment. The Persians seem to have reserved it for usurpers of the kingship. Bessus would later be mutilated and executed, perhaps horribly executed, if we believe some of the ancient accounts, and this also was Persian style. As at Babylon, Alexander's decision to ride on a chariot was a political decision, I believe. As I read it, the message was that Alexander, not Bessus, was the legitimate heir of, once more, Darius III. If so, what about the chariot itself? As it happens, we know that by this date, Alexander had twice captured a war chariot belonging to Darius III, once at Issus and once at Galgamela. It was surely on one of these Persian royal chariots that Alexander now rode past Bessus in order to press home his point. Well, uh, two items emerge here. Firstly, and I do emphasise this point, Alexander, like his father Philip, had a strong sense of theatre. Father and son seem to have been aware of theatrical trickery. The theatre at Vergina on the screen is a reminder that the Macedonian court had been watching Greek plays since the days of Euripides, at least. The British historian Philip Mansell, in his very good book, Dressed to Rule, about modern monarchs, or early modern monarchs, um, uh, dress. Mansell writes that monarchy is, I quote, a system relying on emotions and senses as well as political and military might. Queen Elizabeth II's televised coronation, with uh, the very considerable impact that it had around the world, exemplifies this aspect of monarchy, and obviously there's a whole list of such examples from just our own era. My surmise is that Alexander understood intuitively that monarchy requires staging. I also think that he was rather good at it, more so than is generally recognised in the history books. Well, now another question. Who was the intended audience for Alexander's theatricality there in the depths of Bactria? For a partial answer, I turn to Plutarch, writing a generation before Arian. Here is Plutarch describing Alexander's initial appearances in his Persian-style regal costume. At first, Plutarch says, Alexander wore it cat oikon in his quarters. The audience was his elite entourage. Barbaroi, that is, mainly at this date, important Persian <coughs> collaborators, and the mainly Macedonian companions of Hystian, Ptolemy, and Co. Later, Plutarch says, Alexander went public. He appeared before hoi poloi in the new costume. Well, who were this multitude? Plutarch's readers would surely have been put in mind not so much of the rank and file of Alexander's army, but of the ordinary people of Asia. So, in sum so far on uh, this episode, I suggest that Alexander rode past Bessus on a former royal chariot of Darius III. I suggest, too, that he was wearing his new Persian-style dress created and adopted the previous year. I believe that he put himself on show in this way above all for his new Asian subjects, whether camp followers or the local population specially rounded up for this spectacular. Finally, I note that the verb used here by Plutarch Exelaunine is also used by Herodotus to describe the Persian king Xerxes driving out on his royal chari chariot excuse me, in uh, 480 BC. 
So it's possible, likely even, that Alexander found opportunities habitually to show himself on a Persian royal chariot wearing quasi-Persian regal dress during these years of conquest in Central Asia. I'm not quite done with this uh, Bessus episode. My final observation is to do with its treatment in the classical sources. If my reconstruction is correct, then the version of Arian is unsatisfactory. It omits the important detail that Alexander rode past Bessus on a former chariot of Darius III. Now, uh, as um, many will know here, silences in ancient historians are notoriously hard to assess. Even so, Arian's omission, if I'm right of course, is either intentional or unintentional. Let's assume for a moment that it was unintentional. The likeliest explanation in that case is that Arian did not find this detail in his two main sources. These sources were two eyewitnesses, namely the lost Alexander histories of the Macedonian Ptolemy and the Greek Aristobulus. Both these writers sought to present Alexander favourably to a Greek readership. This meant passing over actions of Alexander which did him, in their judgment, no credit. In particular, the Arian scholar Peter Brunt has pointed to what he calls their, I quote, embarrassed silence about Alexander's partial adoption of the style of a Persian king. So to pick up a point I began to make earlier, Greek writings about Alexander from his own times show two opposing tendencies. On the one hand, vivid description of Alexander's Persianized court in Asia being set down by people like Caris, um, his uh, chamberlain from Mytilene. On the other, a tendency exemplified by Ptolemy and Aristobulus to play down or pass over altogether this same Persianizing behavior. What is reflected here seems to be the duality of 4th century BC Greek attitudes to the Persian Empire. That is, cultural openness, on the one hand, alongside political abhorrence. End of the second segment. My third and fourth segments draw on research of my published recently in Histos, um, this is an online journal of classical historiography, co-edited by John Moles, my colleague at Newcastle, which naturally I commend to those of you who haven't yet come across it. So, the third segment involves a return to Plutarch. In two passages which say much the same thing, Plutarch places Alexander, yes, once again, on a chariot. Both passages are neglected in the scholarship. For instance, J.R. Hamilton's otherwise excellent commentary on Plutarch's life of Alexander is silent here. The core sense of the ancient Greek verb manthanine is to learn. What Alexander is doing here, while in Asia, is learning chariotry and learning archery, and he's doing so by practicing them. The passages imply that Alexander's early education in Macedonia neglected these particular skills. Um, according to Plutarch here, Alexander was not actually learning to drive a chariot. This was a skill in antiquity left to a professional charioteer, Heniokos in ancient Greek. Alexander was learning epibinine and apobinine, that is, how to jump on and off a moving chariot which someone else was driving. There are superficial echoes here of the Greek athletic contest for apobartai, jumpers off. These were athletes who raced each other while jumping off and on a moving chariot. But this, I believe, is a false trail. Plutarch did not have this Greek athletic skill in mind. If he did, he surely would have said so, especially since he has already told the readers of his life of Alexander in an earlier chapter that Alexander disapproved of Greek athletics unless, as Plutarch's Alexander said, he, Alexander, could have fellow kings to compete against. The clue 
to the correct interpretation of Alexander's chariotry lessons lies in the fact that Plutarch couples them with archery practice. Now, archery was no more a traditional specialism of the Macedonians than chariotry. For the bowmen in his army, Alexander mainly relied on specialists from Crete. Crete. It's true that inside Tomb 2 at Vergina, Manolis Andronikos found this splendid gold quiver. But its figural decoration is in the style of the Scythians. To Andronikos, this quiver was something foreign, an exotic import to Macedonia, perhaps, as Andronikos suggested, an item of booty. On the other hand, the bow was a traditional Persian national arm. More than that, it was one of the insignia of Persian kingship with an ideological and a moral value. The slide shows Darius the third, sorry, the first, on the Bissetoun monument holding the royal bow. And here is the last Darius again, Darius the third, as represented in the Alexander mosaic. He too holds the royal bow. The uselessness of a bow in close quarters combat reinforces its symbolic character here as an item of royal regalia. Well, that's the end of uh, my third segment, and in my fourth segment, the one before the last, uh, I explore a little further this mystery of Alexander's chariotry and archery practice. And I now bring on uh, my next clue. This is a fragment from a lost Greek writer called Ephippus of Olynthus. Now, Ephippus, unlike the uh, later Alexander historians I've been citing, was a very different kettle of fish. Um, unlike Diodorus, Curtius, Plutarch and Arian, Ephippus, for a start, was a contemporary of Alexander. All we know about this lost work of Ephippus on Alexander comes from citations in later ancient writings. In his great edition of the fragments of lost Greek historians, Felix Jacobi collected five citations of Ephippus, not quite all of them, as I believe that a sixth can be retrieved from Athenaeus. Anyway, it's uh, Jacobi's fragment number five which interests me now. Ephippus is claiming here that Alexander liked to dress up at dinner as various divinities. One of them, allegedly, was Artemis. Greek divinity and, specifically, Greek goddess of the hunt. Alexander often appeared as Artemis on a chariot, apparently. On these occasions, says Ephippus, he carried a bow, and a Macedonian-style hunting spear, the Sibune. This is an interesting detail, with the ring of authenticity. Some modern scholars believe this ancient story of a cross-dressing Alexander. And I must emphasise, because I have been, uh, I think, misunderstood slightly on this point, I must emphasise that I do not. Uh, I emphasise that. In my opinion, Ephippus is ridiculing, he's making fun of Alexander. Robin Lane Fox already thought the same in his 1973 book on Alexander. And Lane Fox saw the point of the joke. That is, Alexander was seen doing something on a chariot which reminded Greek onlookers, in the heart of Asia, of their goddess of hunting. The stock attributes of Artemis were precisely her bow and her arrow. Here's the bow. And here's the chariot drawn in Greek style, Father Christmas style, by a uh, reindeer. Well, so what's funny, you might think? Well, the joke, insofar as it was a joke, hinged on the detail that Alexander at the time was wearing Persian dress. Classical Greeks often derided Persian male dress as womanly. Ephippus, evidently, was no exception. So I'm going to 
press the pause button on Ephippus for just a moment. To me, he's an interesting character. Uh, and, and really, that's because he clearly disliked Alexander just as much as Curtius, Plutarch, and Arian, centuries later, admired Alexander. In fact, Ephippus was so hostile to his subject that he scarcely counts as a historian. The English language has a rich vocabulary for his kind of writing. Pasquinade, squib, lampoon, libel, satire. So, whom did Ephippus write for? The answer must be all those other people who disliked Alexander and who could understand Greek. At the end of Alexander's reign, Athens was a bastion of these Alexander haters. So the scholarly view that Ephippus wrote here in Athens just after Alexander's death is an attractive one. And this view can be briefly developed. The Ephippan presentation of Alexander to me is reminiscent of the 4th century Athenian orators when they sought to disparage upper class Athenian men before Athenian juries of ordinary democratic citizens. Luxury, effeminacy and godlessness are prominent among the alleged behaviours disparaged in this way. Specifically, these behaviours could include driving on a chariot, wearing soft ankle-length garments, youthful misdemeanours at dinner parties and mocking sacred rites. The type of the dissolute aristocrat in democratic Athens was Alcibiades. And interestingly, just like Alexander, Alcibiades was also said to have cross-dressed at parties, at least according to the 4th century AD Greek writer Libanius of Antioch. And I must thank Michael Vickers for drawing my attention to that passage. Well, just to lighten the mood... Uh, I'm working <laughs> Prince Harry here for the kind of the younger set. Um, uh, be, I, I mean, I just was thought of uh, the fascination um, that uh, democracy still has um, for um, wayward royal princes. It has a particular attraction, especially in a democracy, for better or for worse. I mean, most of the stuff about Prince Harry seems to be true. Um, <laughs> well, uh, before... The beef eaters beckon me to the Tower of London. I return to the historical Alexander, not the Alexander of ancient Greek ridicule. Ephippus, and this is what interests me, gives us for the first and only time an ancient picture, a word picture, which combines the following four elements. Alexander wearing his quasi-Persian regal dress, Alexander on a chariot, Alexander armed with a bow, and Alexander going out to hunt. What does this mean? And what is the connection, if any, with Alexander practising archery and chariotry in Asia, according to Plutarch? To my knowledge, no one before me has asked these questions. Well, some famous images of ancient Near Eastern royal hunts seem to provide an answer. Here, hunting on a chariot, is the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. Like Alexander, Ashurbanipal is equipped with a bow, held here by an attendant, and with a spear, which he's using to attack a very hungry lion. Here is an Achaemenid Persian king, Darius I, once more, on a cylinder seal in the British Museum, also hunting lion from a chariot with a bow and arrow. Finally, Diodorus of Sicily records Darius's descendant, King Artaxerxes II, once more hunting lion from a chariot. Artaxerxes II died in 359 BC. Alexander was born in 356 BC. The thrust of my argument should be obvious by now. As I believe... Alexander learnt chariotry and archery in order to hunt lions in the traditional style of Near Eastern kings. In doing so, Alexander once more posed as their heir, 
That is, he presented himself as a king of a kind familiar to the former subjects of the Achaemenid dynasty. If I am right, then the surviving Alexander material from classical antiquity is once again silent, silent about what might strike us as a particularly startling new development in Alexander's Persianizing. If there were time, a lot more could be said about the place of the royal lion hunt in the court cultures of both Macedonia and the ancient Near East. Recent work by scholars such as Thomas Olson, Ada Cohen and Halle Franks, Halle Franks has focused attention on the royal hunt as both a courtly social practice where kings socialise with um, regional elites, for instance, and as a monarchical symbol of protection, but also, slightly more scarily, of predation, of dominance, of masculinity, all that. I assume that the historical Alexander saw a political benefit in hunting lion in the manner of the Near Eastern dynasty he'd just overthrown. If I have interpreted Plutarch and Ephippus Fragment 5 correctly, this new style of hunting required application on Alexander's part. Plutarch implies, implies hours of practice. Ephippus derides Alexander for often impersonating Artemis. The hunt was a traditional pastime of the Macedonian court. Alexander's enthusiasm for Macedonian-style lion hunts in Asia is attested in classical authors and, perhaps, we won't go there, here on the Alexander sarcophagus. As I believe, when Alexander pursued his new Near Eastern style of lion hunting, he had discovered a way of combining cultural politics with a personal passion. We cannot dismiss, I don't think, Alexander's new hunting style as a merely superficial engagement with Persian court culture. It's not exactly the same as just slipping on the um, Maison Lucos kitto. Well, that's the end of my fourth segment. Next comes a fifth segment and then a brief conclusion. I fast forward now in time to the months immediately after Alexander's death in once more, and I think importantly, Babylon. The year was 323 BC. My focus now is the dead Alexander's hearse. This was the show-stopping vehicle built in Babylon to transport the dead king's corpse. The reconstruction on screen comes from Michael Frommer's beautifully illustrated 2001 book on Alexander. It is one of a number of scholarly reconstructions, and I should stress that scholars differ significantly in how they envisage this lost vehicle. In 2000, the late Nicholas Hammond published a paper arguing for a design inspired by Macedonian traditions. A year later, Frommer's book was published arguing for a heavily oriental design, so the subject is controversial. But why should this hearse interest the historian of Alexander in the first place? Well, the intriguing possibility here is that the designers of this hearse might have paid tribute to the dead Alexander's political and cultural ideas. So, the hearse may not survive, what we do have is a detailed description by once more Diodorus of Sicily, which probably, it's not absolutely certain, but which probably goes back to um, Hieronymus of Cardia, the historian of the successors, um, who is generally uh, regarded um, as a high-quality historian by modern scholarship. According to Diodorus, paintings adorned the outside of the hearse, their theme was Alexander's military might. The paintings depicted Alexander's army, Alexander's navy, and Alexander himself flanked by Macedonian and Persian soldiers. According to Diodorus, the painting of Alexander placed him, yet again, on a harmer, a chariot. This time, however, not standing, but rather intriguingly sitting. Diodorus adds that Alexander held a splendid sceptron, that is, a scepter. Sceptron, the staff of 
command associated in Greek literature since Homer with kings. Well, what should we make of this scene? In his fine book on the image of Alexander in ancient art, Andrew Stewart points out that Greek artists did not normally show Macedonians, Greeks or Persians, that is to say non-mythological people, sitting in chariots, not sitting, standing but not sitting. But was Alexander's hearse made, we must remember, in Babylon, was it solely a Greek work? Diodorus states explicitly that the wheels were Persian, whatever that meant exactly. To interpret this Alexander scene, we may need to look outside the norms of 4th century BC Greek art. As it happens, depictions of high-status individuals seated on chariots are attested in the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Of the two examples known to me from the visual arts, the most impressive is this solid gold model chariot from the so-called Oxus treasure, now displayed in the British Museum. The objects in this treasure are mostly thought to date from the 5th and 4th centuries BC. Among other signs of his high status, this seated figure wears an Achaemenid Persian style necklace or talk, the sort of thing that Darius III wears in the Alexander mosaic. Now, the circumstances of discovery of the Oxus treasure back in the late 19th century are somewhat controversial. My next example, my second example, comes from an archaeologically unimpeachable context. This elderly man, seated in a chauffeur-driven chariot, is depicted on a 5th century BC frieze found at Xanthus in Lycia, Lycia in southwest Turkey. As scholars have seen, this processional frieze shows a startling closeness to the Persepolis reliefs. Note especially the crests on the horses' heads and the way the grooms rest an arm on top of their horses. That is, this relief brings us closer to the Persian court. And we can perhaps get closer still. This is because, even more intriguingly, the ancient Near East also knew a tradition of wheeled thrones for kings. In Assyrian art, at least two Assyrian kings are depicted in this way. This 7th century BC relief comes from Nineveh. The right-hand slab is now known only from a drawing. It shows King Sennacherib sitting on a chair with arms and back in a high-wheeled carriage pulled by two ewes. This image, by the way, illustrates the debt of the later Persian kings to their Assyrian predecessors. The throne, the footstool, the scepter, the parasol, the Achaemenid Persian kings took over all these attributes of Assyrian royalty as here. The Achaemenid kings also took over this idea of a wheeled throne. The distinguished Iranologist Peter Kalmeyer, who died in 1995, drew attention to the description in Herodotus of the military procession of King Xerxes on his way to Greece in 480 BC. Included in this procession was a horse-drawn harmer or chariot. This contained an empty thronos or throne symbolising the unseen presence of the Persian divinity Ahura Mazda, that is, Zeus to the Greeks. In sum now, on Alexander's hearse, a painting made in Babylon of a sceptered Alexander seated in a chariot surely would have reminded an Asian audience first and foremost of traditional Near Eastern images of kingship and indeed of divinity. The intended meaning of the Alexander painting would be clearer if we knew whether the Persian kings were ever themselves conveyed on wheeled thrones, especially in these military processions about which we hear a lot in classical sources. On this point, we simply do not have the facts, although to me the circumstantial evidence at least favours the possibility. 
However, sometimes the historian, and not least the historian of Alexander, has to pinch himself and remember to say, I don't know. That's the end of uh, my fifth segment, and I now conclude. Well, I mean, even in his own world, Alexander was clearly a very unusual man. What was he really like? Taking a leaf from Plutarch's parallel lives, I humbly offer my own synchrosis comparison. As a tool for thinking about Alexander, my comparison is perhaps no more outlandish than Plutarch's. Plutarch, after all, compared Alexander with Caesar. My comparison is with Lawrence of Arabia. And as justification, if one is needed, I plead a British school connection. Lawrence's brother was the distinguished British classical archaeologist A.W. Lawrence. He is the figure on the left, sorry, on the right, in that group photo of the Lawrence brothers up on the screen. And the school connection, you're maybe thinking, where's he going with this? The school connection is that A.W. Lawrence uh, was um, a predecessor of mine. He was a visiting fellow here back in 1967. Well, recently I read an article on Lawrence of Arabia by the British historian Bernard Porter. The parallels with Alexander are striking, at least superficially. Both looked a bit strange, for a start. Lawrence apparently had a disproportionately large head. Alexander was clean-shaven, an oddity for a leader of men in those days, whether in Greece or in Persia. Both died prematurely, Alexander aged 33, Lawrence aged 46. Both were charismatic men, people fell for them. Both possessed intriguing character traits attractive to biographers, certainly to modern biographers. Both were inspired by heroes of the past, and both craved the same kind of heroism for themselves. Homer's heroes for Alexander, medieval knights for Lawrence. Both donned Eastern robes in order to win over the natives. Lawrence probably had a genuine preference for the Bedouin Arab way of life. As I believe, Alexander too developed a genuine liking for Persian customs. At least that's what his learning Persian-style archery and chariotry suggests to me. However, you could fairly object that these similarities are indeed superficial. At any rate, they do not conceal the huge differences. Nowadays, Lawrence is in fact seen as an anti-imperialist, as someone, that is, who acted in Arabia against the wishes of the British Empire, his employer. By contrast, Alexander was an empire builder. This is the point of Plutarch's comparison with Julius Caesar, con conqueror of Gaul, etc. As for my focus on Alexander's use of Near Eastern chariots, if I'm right, of course, what this does is to um, emphasise not cross-dressing, but cross-culturalism. And this cross-culturalism of Alexander might seem to give him um, a certain resonance in today's globalised world, when acquiring empires by conquest, no matter how good a general you might be, has definitely gone out of fashion. As for the historical figure, not the symbol, um, I end with this big question about Alexander posed 50 years ago by the Oxford historian Guy Griffith. Quote, the administration of Alexander's empire raises only one question that is absolutely vital, namely how far, if at all, Alexander changed the system which he found existing in it already. The answer to this question goes some way, perhaps much of the way, towards answering how far, if at all, Alexander was a man of reflection and a planner, and not predominantly a man of action in war and of improvisation in the art of peace. Well, I know what my answer would be. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us this evening for what I think has been a, a truly fascinating lecture. Would you now please join us and meet the speaker on the lawn of the Upper House, since it's a lovely fine night. Let's have a garden party. <laughs>